Dun, dun, dun. So I'm letting everybody, giving everybody a chance to click and get in after I launch the webinar. Before I say, hey, it's Bob. And um, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody out there, wherever you happen to be. Uh, I'm still in Melbourne, Australia, where it's um, freaking cold. It's like almost winter here. And I don't know why I keep picking these winter climates to go hang out at. I spent February in, um, in um, Denmark, of all places. So uh, yeah, Rob, yeah, you should get the fuck out of Vegas, baby. Um, George, welcome. Or is it Jorge? Never quite sure how to pronounce that one. Um, I want to thank everybody. This is a really special um, edition for me. I hope you guys enjoy it. I assume that's why you're here. Um, about, I don't know, a few months ago, uh, some news hit the wire and it and it really rocked the, the location-based VR world. And it was a blog post on Medium. And um, hey, Victor, hey, Molly, thanks for, uh, for joining. And uh, it was about uh, Sandbox VR had just signed uh, a letter to raise $68 million from Andreessen and Horowitz, which is one of the leading <clears throat> um, venture firms in the world, venture capitalist firms. Hey, Gheorghe, Andre, and um, wow, great audience from all around the world. This is really cool. And, uh, and we all read it. We read it. I read it. I'll speak for myself. Um, and I was just blown away because I had just gotten back from CES and I met with uh, Tipitat, who runs the VR fund. And he's a kind of a legendary investor in the VR space. And, you know, I was talking to him about what's happening in the venture community for location-based VR. And he just shook his head and he shut me down. He said, nothing. Can't raise money from venture capitalists. And I said, really? He says, nope, nobody's going to give it any money. It's too hard to scale, um, too expensive, you know, slow growth. And like he was, and he was really high on it in the early days. I'd met with him uh, along with Tim Roos from Zero Latency when I was working with those guys in Silicon Valley around the SVVR conference. And he was really high on location based and he had just shut it down. And then like a month later, boom, 68 million bucks. And, um, and then at the at the conference, the Microsoft Reactor VR Arcade conference that Jeremy Lamb founded and Louisa Spring um, co-hosted this year around virtual reality and esports, there was a panel of venture capitalists. And so when they turned to audience questions, of course, I raised my hand and I said, "What do you guys think of the Sandbox VR fundraise from Andreessen?" And you know, the room, like everybody, just kind of got on the front of their seats because it was the question I think everybody had on their mind, but no one wanted to ask for some reason. I'm always willing to ask that question, by the way. And um, and they all just looked at each other and they looked at me and they shrugged their shoulders and they were like, we have no idea. Um, and uh, and one of the guys said, maybe, you know, obviously Andreessen is smarter than I am. And, uh, and, and they're probably smarter than a lot of people are uh, in and out of the <laughs> Sand Road, Sand Hill Road. But it was uh, it was just a testament to nobody got it. Nobody understood it. And so. You know, there's all kinds of rumors and innuendo flying around around why it happened and and how it happened and you know were the founders friends with the people at Andreessen and everything and then um, Andrew Chen, who's one of the general partners at Andreessen, posted a video and they they have this new series on YouTube, which by the way, um, it's uh, they, the the company's inside called A16Z or A16Z and um, and they've posted a YouTube video kind of showing the behind the scenes of the venture community, which I think is brilliant. And it's great watching and you should subscribe to it if you haven't already. And the first video they posted was the pitch deck from Sandbox VR. And not only the pitch deck, but the pitch with the founders, Siki Chen and Steve Zhao, um, pitching it to Andrew Chen with full commentary and then Andrew later in the video, kind of giving his reactions to it um, or what he remembers reacting to in the time. And then since then they've done on post another video, which is the founder story, by the way, which is also excellent, which you should watch. Um, and, and I watched it. I remember I was driving down a Torquay uh, here in Melbourne, trying to get some surfing down in Bell's beach. And I was kind of listening to it on YouTube while I was driving. And I was just like, 
oh my God, there's so much gold in this. And it really shifted my perspective, um, A, on Sandbox, because my personal experience with Sandbox was, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't impressed at all. And, um, but then I'm not impressed with anything these days or very little, very few things in VR had I been impressed with at the time. Um, uh, but in the, but on the whole, the whole way you position things, and that's a big thing of what I do. For those of you that have worked with me, you know that positioning's part of the work that I do in my go-to-market strategy workshop. It's part, it's all about how do you position yourself against the competitor in the market? So you put your first, your best foot forward or your special sauce out there, what I call spine, finding your unique value. And these guys give a masterclass on it. I'm just going to tell you right now. And so my first experience with Sandbox, I was in Hong Kong and um, I was there last summer in July with the guys from uh, Minority Media and Holodeck. And we were there for the Asian Amusement Expo. And we decided, hey, let's go check it out. And we got there and we went and we played and we played. I think it was called Deadwood Mansion, which is kind of their zombie wave shooter. And, um, and there were a couple of things about it that I love. Let's just get this out of the way first. One was um, I loved the green screen and the mixed reality technology. And we're going to talk about that. And, and that was one of the things that, that Andrew Chen from Andreessen highlighted in his in the blog post was that was one of the reasons he did the deal. He said, and we'll talk about that more. And I loved it. I thought it was the best part of the experience. The other thing I liked is they really built this inherently social mechanism is when you die in the game um, and they're using full body tracking, which I have mixed opinions on. But in this case, it was a great example of why you should use full body tracking, which is when you die, one of your teammates has to place his hand on your shoulder to revive you. And that creates this innately social um, co-op gameplay mechanic, which is one of the more clever things I've seen in location-based VR. Now, the execution, I think, needed some work um, and because it was a little frustrating to use at times, the space was really small and the pacing of the game wasn't good. And, and frankly, 10 minutes in, it, was so, it felt so repetitive to me, I was ready to shoot myself in the head um, to get out of it. But that's my own bias having played all the VR out there, the great stuff, the not so great stuff. And considering they started the company with, if you read the founder story, you know, less than a million dollars and they brought this thing to market, actually what they did was 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 remarkable. And so um, really cheers to 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 Siki and 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 Steve and the whole team there at for what you guys did. And and I'm a fan of entrepreneurs. I love entrepreneurs. I love when entrepreneurs are successful. I love when entrepreneurs raise money and make money. And so I got goosebumps when I saw the news announcement and then reading the backstory. Um, I'm just kind of in love with these guys. So so anyway, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to play the pitch um, from the Andreessen um, uh, YouTube channel. And we are going, and then I'm going to pause it at certain times to talk about what I think are key elements in it. And this isn't just about pitching to investors. This is about positioning your company, your product, whatever it is in the market. And this stuff is going to apply. Some of this is going to apply to whether you're marketing a VR arcade, marketing a VR solution, um, selling toilet paper, um, or pitch, doing a pitch deck to investors. And I'll try to call out as much of that as I can. And I will definitely, Sandra, I will definitely share the link um, to the YouTube channel. Good call. Um, and uh, and uh, let's get going. So, be anyone and go anywhere. Um, we it's have a it's a place where you can be anyone and go anywhere. I was already watching it, so I'm going to back up a little bit. And this is going to be a little mystery science three thousand, mystery science theater three thousand. If you guys um, are familiar with that show. One of my favorites, they take old science fiction movies and then they do commentary on top of them. And um, it's a bit irreverent and um, and really funny. So you should watch that if you haven't. What's that box VR? VR? What a holodeck company. All right, so I'm going to stop right there. They start out with, we're the holodeck company. And my first reaction to this was, hmm, there's a company called Holodeck VR. And... Um, and that's a bit of a ripoff, um, but they ripped off Star Trek. So how much of that is really true? That's my own bias, right? Um, and and so, but what they're doing is you got to have a hook. Like this is the thing. This is their headline. So if you're writing marketing copy, if you're advertising, if you're doing a, a pitch deck, you got to have a hook. By the way, if you haven't read Stephen Pressfield's Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit, 
this is one of the things he talks about is nobody wants to read your shit. Nobody wants to read your investor deck. Like these guys at VC firms get thousands of decks, right? And and if you don't capture them in the first couple of slides, you got no shot. You've lost their interest. So um, so the hollow deck company was a bold move. First of all, does everybody know what a hollow deck is? So they're taking a risk right there, assuming that anybody in this space looking at VR in this market is going to understand that they're going to be a Star Trek fan. And in this case, it paid off because you know Andrew was a Star Trek fan and he remembered the hollow deck. And so it was a bold move. And there's a bunch of bold moves in this deck, by the way. Um, and it paid off. And sometimes you got to swing for the fences if you want to hit a home run. And um, and so just make sure your headline grabs attention or stops people and gets them to think, or it could be controversial. It could be, um, it could be a lot of things, but it's gotta be bold. So that's the headline. We're going to move off of that. So, so let's, let's be real. real. VR, VR has, has been, been a disappointment. disappointment. Now you want to talk about, um, you want to talk about a bold move. VR has been a disappointment. Let's be real. I'm going to let him play through a couple of these things. I'm going to talk about this at length. Adoption, Adoption has been disappointing. There are, there are 120 million cost units worldwide and 25 million New York has students. Not only that, only that engagement, engagement has been, has been disappointing. 73% 73 73 of all VR users, users churn. Right. We, want we wanted the holodeck. But instead, but instead we got, we got a, disembodied a disembodied head, head right, with right, floating joysticks, and you tether tethered to a computer, computer sitting by yourself, sitting by in, yourself a chair, in a chair, home alone. So, we went and built a freaking holodeck. It's a place where you can be anyone and go anywhere. Um, we have. Right through. Did it get better? And if it did, I'm going to go back and replay that. Give me a quick comment. Yeah, all right. So let's go back and um, let's go back and and hit that again. And I'll mute my microphone. Thanks. One of the problems is testing this stuff is uh, is a little bit hard. So VR has been a disappointment. Adoption has been disappointing. There are 120 million console units worldwide, and only five million VR headset students. Not only that, engagement has been disappointing. 73% of all VR users churn. Right? We wanted the holodeck, but instead, we got a disembodied head right, with floating joysticks, and you're tethered to a computer, sitting by yourself in a chair, home alone. So here's what I love about this. They started with the elephant in the room. They led with the negative, which is terrifying if you're selling something, right? Most people, and this is where they go wrong, and I teach this to anybody I do sales training with or marketing even, is don't be afraid of what everybody knows that's your weakness, right? Work really hard to overcome your weakness on the product development side. But while it's a weakness, you gotta talk about it because your competitors are talking about it, which means your customers know about it, which means if you're not talking about it, you're not being honest. And that means they're not gonna trust you and they're not gonna believe anything you say. And so what I love about starting with the negative is it builds your credibility instantly. If I'm willing to go into a pitch with a venture capital firm and I'm willing to say, you know what? VR has been a massive disappointment and here's why, and here's why it's terrible. Now, first of all, I've captured their attention because nobody does it, right? Nobody starts out with why you should like VR. Um, and now all of a sudden I'm believable. And I believe, and in my experience, that if I start with the negative, everything I say after that has increased credibility. And I can even make shit up and people are gonna start believing it because I, was, I talked about the elephant in the room. And so um, I just love that they started with the ne negative. And Andrew Chan later in the commentary, which I don't know if we're gonna get to, but you can watch it yourself if you haven't watched it. Um, he actually calls this out as the thing that captured his attention. He's like, whoa, that's bold. I can't wait to see what these guys have to say next. So start with the negative when you're selling. If you've got a product and you're going to market with it, um, I like to tell you, when I was with zero latency, frankly, um, I would tell people, here's the reasons you don't wanna buy zero latency. It's really expensive, VR is really early, there's risk of, um, of techno, tech, technological obsolescence. 
And they'd be like, whoa, what do you mean? And I'd be like, well, VR is moving really quick. It's rapid. You're going to have to upgrade your, your, your technology um, you know, at some point. But here's how we dealt with it. We had, you know, we were using consumables that were not really a significant part, like the headsets weren't a significant part of the cost of the whole transaction. So if you had to upgrade those every 24 months, here's how much it would cost you. And they'd be like, ah, okay, yeah. And so putting the risk out there and then talking about how you're going to deal with the risk versus waiting for them to come back with the objections builds your credibility, which will increase your close rate. So I know it's scary, but you should try it. All right, let's move on. So we want to build a freaking holodeck. It's a place where you can be anyone and go anywhere. Um, we have movie quality motion capture technology. It captures every movement of you and your friends. You can high five a friend in VR for real who's next to you. You can go anywhere because you can roam freely about in a fairly large space in our sandboxes. You're untethered by wires. And the thing we hear the most from people who've tried other VR experiences, hey, I didn't get motion sick. Um, and we've got some extreme stories about that, but you can run, walk, crouch, jump, and it all just works. This is about positioning. And I talk a lot about positioning. Um, I've posted on my blog and in my email some books about positioning. Stephen Rise's book, Positioning, by the way. I think it's David Rise, Michael Rise, R-I-E-S. The book's called Positioning. It's the seminal book on this in marketing. Um, and these guys have done a great job of positioning because as I've told anybody that comes to me and says, hey, I'm thinking about doing something in the location-based VR space as a solution provider, my first thing to them is it's really freaking crowded. There's dozens of companies. There's little differentiation. Um, it's hard to stand out. <clears throat> and so we're going to have to work really hard on positioning you against the noise in the market to show why you're different, why you're better, why people should buy your product. So what these guys did was, um, was they positioned themselves against the consumer market. It was brilliant, right? It wasn't about positioning against the 25 other companies making free roam, right? Thank you, Mark. That's the book. Um, Al Rice, thank you. <laughs> um, and Al won't be listening to this, so that's cool. He won't mind that I hacked his name. Um, but it's not about, it's not about who you think your competition is. It's who can you really position yourself well against that's relevant in the mind of whoever you're pitching to. And so what these guys did is they put themselves against in the con, what I call a contrast frame against the consumer market, which has been a disaster by any metric, right? Except for fanboys out there who are going to flame me, but that's fine. Um, the statistics show that VR has not been a success in the consumer market, and I'll put yet out there. Um, and so what they did was um, they, they said the problem is the consumer market, and we're the solution. We're Sandbox VR. And what this does is there's a little bit of psychology behind this, right? This is, actually goes to Maslow's hierarchy um, the third level need, which is the need to belong or belonging. And there's two ways of using this in marketing. One is to make people feel like they're part of something, right? Um, well, it's all about making people feel that they're part of something, they're part of something, but a unique way to do it is being the, the, the anti something. And so going back in history, there's the, um, Back in, the, in when I was a kid, there was Seven Up had a commercial call, called the Uncola, and there was this really cool guy. He had this deep voice, and he would say, Seven Up, the Uncola. This is an Uncola nut, and it was a lemon and a lime, like half and half. Um, and they were positioning themselves against cola. So if you didn't like cola, you might like Seven Up. To me, the best version of this in market, marketing has been Apple Computer. When they did, remember the PC guy and the Apple guy commercials where they had the PC guy in the tie that was all nerdy with the glasses and he was in a suit and he was kind of frumpy looking and they had the really cool hip Mac guy and he was like, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. And they would do a contrast frame about why you wanted not to be a PC and you wanted to be a Mac and it was brilliant. And so what these guys are doing in their contrast frame is they're saying there's consumer VR, <clears throat> which sucks, and there's us, which is amazing. 
And they're not comparing themselves against all the other companies that have amazing VR stuff out there, like the Void and Dreamscape and Nomadic and Zero Latency. And, and, and we'll get to how they did position their competitive slide a little bit later. But to me, this was brilliant positioning. Um, and as you're like, so for example, if you're running a VR arcade out there or you're running a family entertainment center and you're positioning yourself in the marketplace, who do you think your competition is? Is it the FEC down the road or the bowling center across town or the arcade around the corner? Or is it Fortnite and Netflix, which is what people are doing in the consumer market where you have to get them off the couch and into your facility. And so I think too many of us get focused on this myop myopic sense of competition based on how we define ourselves instead of looking at it as how the market might look at us as, uh, as, as, and fitting within the competition. And so that, com that positioning art is super critical. And these guys fucking nailed it. I love it. All right, let's, let's move. And uh, we put one of these in your neighborhood. So these are some uh, shots from our various locations around the world. That one's from Vancouver. We have one in Hong Kong. Uh, we tried to design these places to not feel too sci-fi, but to be more of a cool place for you to hang out with your friends before and after your experiences. And these locations run our AAA sandbox experiences exclusively. So these are the only places where you can play these games that we've built in-house, uh, from Deadwood Mansion, to our pirate experience, Curse of Davy Jones, to our space elevator experience, Amber Sky. And each of these experiences are designed to be as fun to watch as they are to play. Okay. Again, more gold. Now, um, now this is about exclusivity. Right. And their games, look, I'm just going to, you know, I got to call it as I see it. And I thought the game was pedestrian. Um, I didn't think it was exciting. I didn't think it was very good. I thought it was actually kind of for a 25 minute game. This is the Deadwood Mansion game. Um, again, this is a year ago. My assumption is they've come a long way. And with sixty eight million dollars, they're going to go really fast um, into making amazing games. But for what it was at the time, I kind of thought it was um, the gameplay itself was monotonous, boring and repetitive. And there was little AAA about it, right? So coming from a game background, anybody in the gaming industry that understands what AAA means um, would look at this and be like, mm, what's your definition of AAA? And I'm actually curious about that. If they actually believe it's a AAA experience or were they just positioning it itself as, as such, you know, and that's totally cool, right? Is, is you gotta put your best foot forward. But, but what I love that they did was about the exclusivity like they basically said, okay, VR sucks, building credibility, right? Our game was, and Siki joined us. And I want to thank you, Siki. I wasn't sure if you're going to be on here. Um, the budget for Deadwood Mansion was 30K. Now, that's why I said, considering where they came from and their, and their, and their budget, I thought the whole thing was fabulous. But I am curious about the positioning of AAA. And I don't know if you want to type in a comment about that, Siki, because, and I can't thank you enough for joining this freaking thing, dude. I love you. Um, and um, because that positioning I thought was brilliant. And But it's about the exclusivity. So what they did is they said it's AAA. And don't look, one way you could spin that, and if I was running a SWOT analysis for these guys, which I'd love to do, by the way, um, I would say that you know the whole experience is AAA. I could definitely say that, right? Because it's fully immersive, it's hand tracking, it's foot tracking, it's, you know, it's it's social, you can see your friends in it. And so from that perspective, compared to Fortnite, AAA, right? And so you can spin and we can position things from a period of strength all day long. And um, and I, I love that. The content alone is barely C grade for console. And this is the thing with a lot of location-based VR experiences that I've seen, most of them wouldn't make, see the light of day on a console. Like the, no one would even play it once, to be honest with you. But because it's VR, it's so amazing. And I think something that, um, that Steve said is like VR makes the most amazing tech demo ever. The first time you play it, no matter what it is, your mind is blown, even if it's cardboard. If you've never done VR, you put cardboard in your head like, fuck, right? And so um, I think, but we're gonna move out of that pretty soon. And people are gonna start getting used to VR and their expectations are gonna grow. And so we're gonna have to, you know, I think the content developers are gonna have to really get a handle on what is the experience people are gonna wanna experience in VR. And I have a lot of thoughts about that for another time. So anyway, but I love the fact that they positioned this as exclusive, right? The only place you can play is at our location. Um, and that, that sets up 
some of the next slides, which we're going to we're going to move on to. So and uh, I just want to acknowledge Siki's comments here. The full body tracking free roam gets us to AAA in terms of guest reaction. Absolutely. And by the way, that was something that I've commented on, I think, every time. And I make sure I say it again here. Every time I've talked about Sandbox and my personal reaction, I also said, but I went and looked at the Google reviews and the TripAdvisor reviews and it was 4.9. So what the fuck do I know? It's good enough for now in the marketplace. But what I want, what I my aspiration for the industry is good enough isn't good enough because I know where it's going, right? I'm a bit of a futurist. I've been able to, I've been predicting this shit for a long time. And I'm telling you where it's going is people's expectations are going to go high. Um, and, um, you know, I don't, and that's possible. See, you say I might've had some technical issues. I'm talking about the gameplay. Like I like technical issues. I'm used to that and latency and lag. And I don't get caught up on that stuff unless it makes me sick. And yours didn't. I think it was, I think it was literally the, the game design, the level design, the fact that I was trapped in one room for 25 minutes, um, you know, with shit just coming at me all the time. And I felt like a couple of different scenes or a couple of different levels would have totally changed the experience for me. So for what that's worth, but I'm sure you guys, you know what you're doing. You don't need me to tell you that. Um, anyway, so let's move on. Um, because one of the big things that we think about is how do we make these experiences be social from the ground up? And after you play, you get a trailer, you get a selfie video, and these become things that are irresistible to share on social. Share around social, right? And so this is, to me, this was the thing, and, and I think Andrew talked about this and wrote about it, and, and and this is brilliant for me because what they did was they put themselves in the center of the zeitgeist, right? So they've now, what's their contrast frame? It's Meow Wolf and it's Museum of Ice Cream, right? It's not just location-based VR, it's immersive entertainment and it's things that people wanna share. And so that contrast frame keeps shifting to all of these things that are really freaking popular. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about this. It's so brilliant, right? So now all of a sudden, you know, it's what is this? It's impossible not to share it. I just think that's, um, I just think that was a brilliant slide. And I think putting it in the place that we're going to talk about how they've built the story too and the pacing of this story, which is also brilliant. But, um, but this is a big piece of it. And, and, and I'll just throw out a, a you know, you know, I'm, I, I'm a big fan of the guys at Mixcast and Blueprint Reality. And I really feel like Sandbox has, um, has built the market for this by this deal, by coming out and saying, you've got to have mixed reality. And it's something that, um, you know, I, I know Seeky would love to keep this as a, as a, as a unique um, competitive advantage, but it's not going to be. It's actually something the industry needs to grow. Um, and Seeky, if you're willing to um, set up an, introduce, an introduction between um, mixed, mixed cast and, um, and Andrew, uh, to have a conversation. There's a big fucking steak, steak dinner in it for you from me as a favor, but we can talk about that offline. Um, yeah. yeah. Guests. guests are blown away across Facebook, Google, and TripAdvisor, and over thousands of reviews is near unanimous five out of five. Uh, we're actually the number one activity in both Hong Kong and Singapore in TripAdvisor. We're the number seven activity in Hong Kong right under Disneyland. You have to make effort to get to the top of TripAdvisor, right? So you have to have a great guest experience, number one. And by the way, the thing that I've found in research that drives the rating of from the consumer of your experience, the number one thing is the, the, the engagement of your employee that greets them. So if you've got, if you've hired a bunch of tech guys who don't have social skills and customer service skills or haven't been trained in that because you're concerned about the technical aspects of running a VR arcade, you've missed the mark. You have to bring in people who are, um, who are amazing customer service people. So um, Adrenaline, uh, Adrenaline Trampoline Parks promoted their best host, party hosts, to VR hosts because they had that guest experience talent and experience to make sure that um, they knew how to deliver that. And they had people in the background dealing with the tech issues and you can train people on tech issues. So that was a really, that was a really important thing. Um, the guys at Park Playground in Belgium use Net Promoter in all of their games and, and kiosks coming and going. And the thing that they found, number one, that affects 
the, um, the rating is the person that greeted them when they walked in the door. And what they do is they actually give shifts on the schedule to the people who drive the highest net promoter scores on their, um, on their, um, in their experience. So like the employee engagement is critical. And my experience there was fantastic. Like it was really personal and, and, and I felt really welcome. And, and I think that's part of that score. Um, and, and the, the guest satisfaction thing and ha but having it in your deck, why do you need it in your deck? It might be obvious, but there, again, there's some psychology behind this, um, guy named Robert Cialdini, I think is how you pronounce his name, wrote, um, a book, back in the 80s, I think it was, called Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. And it's one of the seminal marketing books. Again, if you haven't read this one, get it on your bookshelf. And, um, and he talks about the six ways people are influenced. And actually, he's written a new book recently that talks about the seventh, which is called Unity, which is about belonging, which I opened with, right? But I didn't call that out at the time. Um, and what he talks about is social proof. Like, nobody wants to be the only one. Nobody wants to be the first one. And so, you know, putting social proof that people love this gives comfort to the venture community. And this is really powerful in the venture community, by the way. There's this, you know, there's this thing that, you know, there, there's the problem. Well, I've run, a, I've been in a bunch of venture companies, Ecast being the one that was like, you know, the seven circles of hell. And every year we had to do another round. And often they were inside rounds, which is terrible, right? Because they're down rounds and they cram you down and uh, another story for another day maybe. But, but what happens is they're always looking for some new investor to come in to validate their investment. And so when you get a lead investor, you get everybody jumping in because it's been validated. You don't want to be the only person in. And so, you know, San, you know so, so Andreessen brought in a whole bunch of other VCs to, to do this round and there might five, I think there were four or five or six that were, that were mentioned in it. But, you know, the social proof is critical. Nobody wants to go alone. And so you guys did a great job. I think they did a great job of this. And when you have guest satisfaction, satisfaction like that, you get really strong demand. So, you know, this is a revenue uh, chart for our first uh, 12 or so months of existence. And uh, the first eight months or so is a sad, flat, slightly declining graph that is hard to raise money off of. Um, but what that actually represents is it's basically 100% occupancy for six months straight, morning to night, seven days a week. VCs love growth stories, expansion stories, right? So this notion that high utilization, um, that, that guest satisfaction drives strong demand is the building block of about six slides now that they're going to be building a story upon. Um, and, and so I'm just going to let it play out. And so when we launched our second store in Hong Kong uh, in March last year, uh, it's a much larger store, about two and a half times the size, and on a per square foot basis, revenue actually went up. And we saw the same thing when we recently launched San Mateo. And uh, in terms of repeat usage, 18% of our guests for just that first test room have booked two or more sessions. And this is with us having only the one experience in a really tiny location, no corporate business, you know, we do a lot of team building during the day. And uh, because it's in the high rise, there's also no foot traffic whatsoever. Quickly, one is, um, you know, the, the growth story and talking about the way they opened it, it's like a long flat line um, so again, elephant in the room, acknowledging that that's what it is, but then talking about where it came from. Talking about utilization rates, they're gonna get into a retail comparison here in a minute, which I'm gonna talk more about this in, but talking about high utilization rates um, here is gonna be critical. Um, and the other thing that I, I really like is like the new store is two and a half times more revenue. I think they talk about that in the next slide. And strong demand drives strong economics. Across our corporate stores, we see a very high EBITDA margin. We have a strong sales per square foot. And what's interesting about our retail store is, if you think about retail, uh, like restaurants or um, that sells closing, they have cost of goods sold. We sell time. So we essentially have no cost of goods sold. The economic is very different. And on top of that, our occupancy rate is also very high. And, and strong economics enable Another thing they did here, this is another contrast frame. 
who are we comparing ourselves? Are we comparing ourselves to location-based VR? Or are we comparing ourselves to the retail industry, which is dying and they need a savior. And ours is better because we have no cost of goods, which means we have really high margins. And if there's anything that VCs love as much as growth stories is high margin stories, right? And so um, this is amazing, like really, really smart positioning around retail economics. Now, Andrew goes in later and says he did some research. You know, he's been in a bunch of restaurant pitches and he knows some people that have um, done retail. So he called and checked upon you know them is like how are these metrics and obviously they blanked out the metric because this is you know proprietary information um so you can't see what they are but i'm assuming that they they compare well to retail now one of the things they don't talk about here is and i'm calling this out because you know you don't have to put all your negatives in the soup right you can let those come out in due diligence when you have time and 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 research right and so this is really important they started with what's wrong with VR. What they didn't talk about here in retail is, you know, limited capacity. In retail, you don't have limited capacity. You don't have limited inventory in very few cases, unless you're a really luxury brand, right? You have a warehouse in the back that you can ship more stuff and hang it up on the hangers with. And people come and what they do is they maximize a really narrow shopping window to drive their revenue. One of the challenges with location-based VR is we have a narrow window in which during times people want to go and be entertained and it's called fucking weekends. And if you have really limited capacity, it's hard to make money because one of your challenges is filling your dark times um, and with dark times or, or slow times, weekdays, day times, et cetera, et cetera. And, and changing consumer behavior is really hard. People go out to be entertained on the weekends. And getting them to come out on Tuesday night is not something that's easy. And many of you, by the way, try to do this by counting. You know, you're at 100% occupancy on the weekend. So what you do is you discount your weekdays trying to change consumer behavior. That's the wrong approach. Raise your price on the weekend first until you start to see a softening of demand and do it 5% at a time, no more than 10% at any one time. And we'll get, I'm going to write a whole blog around pricing, by the way, pricing strategies um, in the next month or so. But for now, just raise your price 5 to 10% of the time. Nobody's going to complain. Nobody's going to notice it. And then what you can do is when you start to see a softening of demand, keep your weekday price low to drive that contrast between the weekend and the weekday. And then what you can do is start to lower your weekday price until you start to see your weekend capacity moving over to your weekdays. That's the way I would deal with weekend versus weekday pricing. But the other thing you need to do is groups. And one of the things that they said is they increased their second store by two and a half times footprint and their revenue per square foot went up, right? And this is the other thing I keep telling you guys is bigger, go bigger, go home. You've got to have a big enough facility to be able to do parties and corporate events and team building. And if you have a tiny little facility, it's really hard to do. And so the guys that are making money in VR um, on the operation side have bigger facilities and the little ones are struggling to hold on. I've talked to, I don't know, 100 VR arcades that have less than 10 booths and they're all frustrated with how much money they're making and they're all looking to expand if they have the capital. So go big or go home most aggressive growth. So we started our first pop-up store in June of 2017. And since then, we've opened in cities such as, you know, LA, New York, Bangkok, Vancouver, Toronto. And we have one here in San Mateo Hillsdale. And soon, by the end of summer, the end of this year, we will go from, we have 14 rooms now, to over 50 rooms. And aggressive growth enables exclusive content. <laughs> Okay, so you see how they're building the story, right? It's, uh, it's quality builds satisfaction. I'm sorry. Satisfaction drives demand. Demand drives economics. Economics drives growth. Growth enables content. It's a beautiful story stack. Like, it just builds and builds and builds. And when a VC is watching this or anybody's watching it, like, Boom, 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 boom. I can just see him like, yeah, 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 yeah. And all of these things are absolutely, none of these are controversial. These are all kind of tenets of business, right? Nobody's going to argue with any of those things. And part of selling is getting your customer to say yes, if not verbally in their head. So if I say quality drives satisfaction, well, of course it does. Satisfaction drives demand. Of course, demand drives economics. Well, yeah, growth enables content. Oh yeah, and so I've said yes five or six times in my head, 
And now all of a sudden, I'm in. I've bought. In my head, I've bought. I've said yes five times. So important. So well done. We're our, We're our publisher right now. We are working with external studio to build content for us. But as we scale to hundreds of rooms, we would be able to build a content ecosystem for other developers to build content for us on a much larger scale. And so now, how have they positioned themselves? Potentially as a pub publisher. And Steve catches this and talks about it in the commentary later in the video. So now it's not about, you know, it, it, they're, they're EA, they're Activision, right? They're, um, they're a publisher and what they have to do though is they need VC investment to build the ecosystem, to build the infrastructure, to leverage the publisher and publishers typically have great valuations, right? And so you have to think about what's the VC looking for? Why do you need my money? Why do you need a lot of money? Because by the way, it's just as easy to raise 100 million as it is to raise 5 million or 10 million, right? From their perspective. And so why do I wanna put 50, 60, 70 million dollars into this thing? How are you gonna put it to use? Oh, you have to build a freaking ecosystem. You have to build infrastructure. I get it, okay. And then once you do that, you're gonna become a publisher and you're gonna have a high margin. I'll invest in that all day long. Really, really well positioned when you understand the mind of a venture capitalist. And which builds our network effect over time. Strong demand drives strong economics, which drives aggressive growth, which enables exclusive content, and which drives strong demand. Going on, on things, these things and being critical. And I have very little to be critical about this whole deck um, and the whole presentation. And, um, and so what they've built here is called the virtuous cycle, right? And it's wonderful. It's demand drives economics, like it's that whole story drives content, which drives strong demand. And 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 it's an, and they call it a network effect. And again, getting in the zeitgeist of the venture community, what are the network effect companies right now, right? Um, Uber, Lime, Airbnb, um, Lyft. These are all network connect effect companies where you know you have to grow all the sides together. And as you get more riders, you get more drivers. You get more drivers. You get more riders. You get more hosts. You get more guests. You get more guests. You get more hosts. And so. These guys have all just cashed out of, of these, and maybe they hadn't when they'd done the pitch, but they were about to, and these IPOs and these network effect companies, right? So there's another little ding in the head of the venture community, which is this is actually a network effect business, which by the way, adds complexity, um, because if you don't get the balance right, you can really struggle and stall. Um, and one of the things, and, and one of the things that, well, I think we'll, we'll get to that later, but there, I just want to mention in case I forget is, you know, they talk about the scalability. If you get it right in a city, you can in boom, boom, boom. And that's what Uber did. That's what Lyft did. You know, they went in and they proved it in a city, San Francisco. And then they said, okay, let, let's do the same thing in Chicago, New York and Paris and London. And, you know, obviously there's all kinds of union issues and shit with Uber, which we won't get into. But um, again, network effect, virtuous cycle. For Bootstrapping a whole new medium. Hey, I want to talk, um, Andre just asked a question for Siki about third-party content. And one of the challenges with third-party content, um, in, and, 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 and Siki said not until next year, and I want to give a little bit of insight into why that probably or most likely is, is that you have to have a footprint in order for everybody to make money. And you, we went through this with zero latency, is you need a big enough footprint to slice the pie up one more way. Um, and creating great content, like he said, their next budgets for their content have gone up 10X. So you're now talking about investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in a title. And if you're not in, like I've done my math, I won't say what it is because they have their own math. Their economics are probably different, but you know, you need a number of locations for it to make sense economically. So um, now, it's possible for them to throw a little bit of that money around and pay third parties to do development and maybe do rev shares on some of it where you cover some of it up front. Publishers do that all the time, right? They cover the cost of development in return for the rights. So maybe they're gonna do some of that, but but I think basically you gotta get a big, you probably gotta get to, I think Zero Latency got to 25 locations before they entertained the Scary Girl deal um, uh, from Dan Phil and the guys in, in Canada. And by the way, that was financed primarily through government grants in Canada as well. So their cost of development was really low. 
So we envision that one day these holoplexes, which could be 20 to 40,000 square feet in space, can attract hundreds of users, will be as ubiquitous as movie theaters. The contents that we have will be plastered on billboards and they'll be on trailers. And behind this is a robust ecosystem for top developers and IP content holder to build experiences in our platform. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the thing most founders and early stage companies miss, which is the big fucking vision, all right? We all tend to think small, and there's reasons for that. It's ingrained in our society. Um, and you know, down in Australia here, they have this thing called tall poppy syndrome. Um, and it's something everybody talks about, which is that the tall poppy gets his head lopped off. And the reason for that is because in the culture, if you start being successful and you start talking about your success, all your mates are gonna be like, oh, who the fuck do you think you are? And they start taking the piss out of you and they try to bring you back down to their level. Um, and this is a thing that I actually myself suffered from a few years ago, which is I was surrounding myself with people and I felt bad about my own success because how are they gonna think of me and how is it gonna make them to think about themselves? Like this is deep seated psychological shit that we suffer from. And, and what it does in our pitches is it stops us from dreaming big and talking big because we're gonna be afraid we don't have credibility. Who are we to think we're gonna reinvent the fucking theater industry, right? And that's what these guys are doing. They're dreaming big and they're putting it out there and they created a rendering of something that doesn't even exist except in their imagination and they made it look real. And they coined a term, the holoplex. By the way, I tried to go online and reserve it um, as a domain as soon as I saw the video, it was already gone. Um, so hopefully they grabbed it. Um, and it's freaking amazing. Yeah, Barrel of Crabs. My friend Joshua Paskowitz talks about that in the Paskowitz family, that there's eight brothers and a sister. And anytime one of them has success, the other one grrr, and pulls them back down. And so um, they've painted this vision of this holoplex. And now what they've done is they've said, the, the Hollywood box office is a $40 billion industry. And there's a lot of stuff being written about it being in trouble. Now, whether it is or not is subject to debate, the, the ticket sales are down, but average ticket price is way up and they're diversifying into food and beverage and creating better um, high fidelity experiences, as Randy White would say. Um, and so their revenue is holding or even growing this year. Um, but the whole business is changing to these blockbusters, right? And so whether it's suffering or not doesn't matter. What's being written is the theater industry is in decline based on the metric of ticket sales. And so now there's a $40 billion total address addressable market at stake and Sandbox is positioning themselves as the company that can be the seminal driver of that new medium. Fucking brilliant. Um, and so I just love this. And, and now they're comparing themselves to the theater industry. The contrast frames keep changing, but every one of them is dramatically more impressive. And so um, anyway, really, really well done. I love this. But the vision, don't be afraid to dream big. Don't be afraid to paint the vision in ways that are visible spend the money on a rendering or something that allows people to see what's in your head because every founder has a vision in their head, but you got to get it down in a slide somehow and without a, a lot of words. That's the other thing I want to call out is there's not a lot of words in this deck, right? <clears throat> not a lot of words, too many words and too many decks. So why is this all possible now? Um, I mean, if you look at the technology that enables that, uh, what we do, it's all just barely possible and it's all rapidly improving. So the first uh, VR backpack was released in 2016. At this point, fairly underpowered. The ability to do wireless VR is still pretty nascent and to do six people in a confined space, uh, still not possible. Uh, motion capture technology in real time with just a few sensors with multiple users, that was first possible in 2016. The prices will continue coming down, but the quality and the fidelity of tracking will continue to increase. Uh, headsets. The CV1 was from the Oculus Rift was released in 2016. Um, and in terms of field of view, in terms of fidelity, this is all gonna improve. And we have rudimentary haptics um, so that when you get shot or you know, the, the zombie touches you, you can feel it. But this is also gonna get massively better. And this is all gonna get massively better through a technology e ecosystem outside of uh, us that as uh, the hardware improves, our experience gets better automatically. this slide in here there's a couple of things first of all this is the first slide about what a lot of companies would see as their product which is about the stuff you can touch and feel and we're on slide 15 
And it's the first time they've talked about hardware, right? And so, so many slides I see, so many decks from investors and marketing materials too, are about the product. And these guys are about the experience. And we're gonna to get to that, I think, in the next slide. Um, but so that's one thing I wanna call out is nobody cares about the hardware unless you're a hardware company. If you've designed some amazing piece of hardware and that's your product, then by all means, talk about it. But talk about it in the terms of market acceptance and, and, and market awareness and market demand and how it's gonna change the market, 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 market. Um, don't talk so much about the technology. Talk about patents if you've got them. Investors love that. They love intellectual property. But I love the fact that we didn't even get to this until slide frickin' 15. Um, and the other reason that this is in here is, you know, by now you're talking about an ecosystem, right? In the pitch. And, and a, an investor, smart money, uh, VC, might be thinking, all right, so what do you have to do to do that? Think about the theater industry. You've got projectors and, pro and, and production companies and, and seats and popcorn machines and buildings and real estate and operations. And oh, fuck, that's a lot of stuff. It's really complex. So how do you start stripping some of the complexity out of it? And one of the things that the most complex, hardware is hard, um, and one of the most complex, especially as it's evolving really rapidly, um, is the hardware. So let's just at least start to talk about, we're not in the hardware business. We don't need to be in the hardware business. Um, and we can, um, you know, and we can state that out here. And the other thing that investors have, this thing that always, I get this question all the time when I'm in pitches, is um, why hasn't anybody else done this? Or why hasn't this been done before? And so you're answering that question before it comes up. The reason it hasn't been done before because it wasn't possible period. Um, and that eliminates that question in case it comes up. So anticipating the questions of your audience and answering them in your sales pitch or your marketing materials, really, really well done. Yeah, so in a digitally saturated world, experience is king. So retails, they need new upscale social experiences. You know, we're also noticing that millennials are spending more time and money in experiences as well. So just as an example, the reason why we've gotten a space in Hillsdale is the landlord you know, reached out to us and offered us a very competitive uh, rent deal in order to get us into the space. Yeah, and it's an operational intensive business. Of this, so now talk about zeitgeist again. Experience economy, millennials, there's a graph that shows this massive up to the right. There's a trillion dollars in spend highlighted. Millennials command over a trillion dollars in spend. Again, total addressable market on the consumer side. So all of this is, um, you know, is about being in the zeitgeist and tapping into something and showing that we're on the right side of the curve. Uh, really, really, really well done. Nice. Nice. Yeah, and it's an operational intensive business. And there's a number of other companies who are doing uh, what is called location-based VR. And um, we see the space in sort of these four quadrants. There's these things that are what we call attractions. Fundamentally, a walk-through passive experience. Um, there's a lot of things that you can touch. Everything's mapped. Um, and uh, it's higher in immersion, but it's difficult to scale out in terms of content, right? It's very difficult to change uh, one experience to the next from day to day. Um, then there's arenas, and these are multiple thousands of square foot in space, um, and these are fundamentally l much closer to laser tag. And we see these as akin to sort of the go-kart businesses of the past, and if the difficulty of scaling that one is going to be around real estate. It's very difficult to make the economics work, and even if you can make it work, you can't put a whole lot of these very large spaces everywhere. Um, and then there's arcades, and there's thousands of arcades out in the world, um, and they use the same kind of hardware that you can get at home, and it's the same experience, and it's targeting people who don't have the hardware at home. And we think for it to win, you have to be the most scalable to create that network effect and ecosystem, and also be the most immersive. And that's why we designed Sandbox to be a standard format, very easy to swap out content, whether it's narrative, or in the future esports, or educational content. Um, it's just a platform. Um, and uh, economics make it work um, and makes it possible to scale. Um, and all, that, all of that starts from a great product that people actually want. You think about Interesting 
how they talked about this and some of it, because this is really important. Um, and one of my questions for Siki is when you made the pitch, did you actually have the names of the companies in here? Um, and did you pull them out just because you didn't want to? Um, yeah, that's what I figured. Okay, cool. And I have my own guesses. I'm going to play a guessing game um, as to which company is which, because I think it's fun. And lots of people are talking about that. And so, um, and then we're going to go into the reaction to this slide from Steve, because I think the conversation was really brilliant and we're running out of time. And this is the part I think was the most interesting. But, um, and so um, let's go ahead and listen to the conversation first and then we'll play the guessing game. Um, we wanted, we to, wanted to, to put our competitors, put our competitors on the plot. On the plot. <laughs> so <laughs> um, we thought about, we thought what, about makes what makes us different. Us different. Um, yeah. And at a time, at a time we, we felt like, okay, like, okay, like, like we just, we just you know, we wrote down the things that are different, right? So. Embodiment, embodiment is super, is super immersive. immersive. Um, we don't do the uh, you can touch all the walls and the tables, right? That um, a lot of other companies are doing. We're not doing thousands of square feet. So, you know, some of it was exercise how do you turn what is can be perceived as a weakness into a strength? Um, and what's the right way to plot it such that we're in the top right corner? I mean, this is the same exercise every startup does when they're fundraising. Right. Um, and the two things that we thought we went on is like, just the immersiveness of it by virtue of the social and how scalable it is by virtue of the standard format right and the the strength of the unit economics right and from that perspective we plotted it um and then as we plotted this we realized too that <coughs> these quadrants you know we want to label these quadrants too because you know like one of the things that we try to not do is like we are one of 12 VR LBEs, right? We want to be its own thing and also trying to be intellectually honest. That's why we're not the only company in the top right quadrant. Yep. Um, and yeah, so we thought about that as like, okay, there are actually these three categories that we know, right? There's a, the equivalent of a Disneyland dark ride. There are these large go-kart style laser tag arenas and then there's arcades. And we want to be a different thing. And here's how we can justify our different thing because that combination of scalability and immersiveness um, makes it a new format. Right. Yeah, I, I, so what, what I was going to say here is that, um, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, <coughs> of trying more of these, uh, of, you know, a couple a couple different products, you know, in this space, I, you know, it's it's funny because it's like you always, you know, like every startup wants to put themselves in the in the top right quadrant, as, as, as you were saying. At the same time, um, I actually just think that there are just different, like, DNAs of teams floating out there, right? You have a couple folks, um, you know, that are approaching it basically from the film world, and you know they're they're building a whole thing. And so for them, um, you know, the immersiveness, the storytelling, that's the most important part. You know, they're probably ahead on um, you know IP licensing and having like kind of quote unquote you know sort of household name characters, um, you know, that are in there. And so that's like one bet that I think as an investor, if you wanted to take, you could try and you know back onto those teams, right? I think that's one. The other thing is that there's definitely another set of folks that seem to be thinking about this almost as like kind of a theme park plus plus kind of thing. Very, very large format, you know, kind of, um, you know, spaces. Uh, the average sandbox VR room is like, it's, it's, it's like a thousand square feet plus or minus, right? Um, you know, there are folks that are out there with thousands of square feet, right? Okay. Trying, to, trying to create these. And so I think one of the questions is, okay, well, if you have the theme park DNA, you know, like if you could build the next like set of you know Disney theme parks, that's actually potentially also a great you know great business, yep. right? And so I think to me actually the 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 interesting um, choice and and the debate that actually went on um, a bit in the team is, um, you know, I would actually say that if you went for a really really large format room, household character names, etc. You could argue that, like, from a purely experiential standpoint, that um, you know there are other players that maybe are further along than than Sandbox. You know, at the, at the moment that when we when we originally invested, because it was primarily based on the one kind of you know minimum viable product version of of, of Deadwood, um, and so so I thought saw that as like is that a but is that a strength or a weakness if you believe in the scalability of a smaller format room, right? And so I came into this thinking. Of you know, if you're going to bet on a theme park plus plus, film plus plus, arcade plus plus, or gaming plus plus, like of, of all those DNAs as kind of the root, that I would bet on the the games piece, um, you know, like more than anything else, because I think 
games and maybe film is is would be the other one, Th- but those two feel like they're the most um, conducive towards creating something that you could do maybe every every week or maybe even every day once there's enough content, right? And so, but but I think there's a real debate to say like, oh well, you know, is is sandbox actually the best experience on the market, you know, today, right? And, and, and is a large format thing actually a, a quote unquote better, more of a wow experience for consumers? And so I think you're, you're actually making a real trade off here in the experience. And I think the, the non obvious part, I think for people, you know, for an investor would be would you rather own, you know, a small number of large theme parks or would you rather own something that feels more like it's a, you know, something where there's dozens of them in every city? Right, and so I, I, I chose. You know, I saw this as a bonus, but I think, you know, that's something that needs to be conveyed. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. I'm going to focus on the positioning piece, though, again, because that's kind of my jam, and that's something that I find that companies really struggle with. Um, and so the first thing that they had to do here was they had to create a con. You know, what's what's the criteria, and. Um, and what you do when you do this is you come up with criteria that if you're doing this about positioning your product to an investor, right, is you do it with the, the axes have to be things that are your strength. And so, you know, total immersion because of the hand tracking and the foot tracking and the, um, the fact that they're investing in optical tracking systems, which are expensive and the green screen and all of that is about immersion. So it makes sense that they would choose that. And then scalability makes sense, too, because if you're pitching to investors they need to see a scalable opportunity. And so if that bottom thing is anything but scalability, you probably don't even get in the door. And so really smart around how they positioned it, right? And then all of a sudden, um, you, know, you know, now all of a sudden you've got, how do you put yourself, you've put yourself in the top right quadrant by, by selecting the things that are your strengths. Um, and then how do you give them something to talk about within the other quadrant? I love the way they've, you know, they've they've labeled them, you know, arcades and attractions. And I can't actually see what that other one is in the bottom left corner because it's covered up by my by my screen. But um, so I love the I love the contrast frame here. But make sure you create a graph like this, that if you're pitching to investors, growth, scalability, something that shows arenas, thank you, um, that shows the ability to grow. Um, is one of the things that the investors need to need. Like prop, per unit profitability is critical, um, but if you only put one in a country, it's not, right? And so, unless I guess it's a billion dollar business. So anyway, I think there's, a, there's so much here. The, the thing I wanna do, and I wanna play the guessing game because A, that'll be fun. And so um, company A, go ahead and type in there, who do you think might be company A, which is really um, high immersive, but, low scalability. So go ahead and type in the comments. Mark thinks it's the void. Um, and see, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. That's totally cool. Um, uh, Dreamscape, I think that was, uh, I think that's probably the void. Dreamscape, yeah, I think that those are, um, Logan's probably trying to work with one of those companies or is and doesn't want to say. But I thought of Nomadic, the void, Dreamscape, um, and uh, and some of the ones that are like really full body tracking, immersive, haptics, room, you know, mapping to the thing. Um, I also think that it's funny that 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 Sandbox positioned themselves just more immersive than those companies. Which, um, yeah, I'm kind of curious about how they they might have justified that, or is that just a registration error because the the PowerPoint slide snapped to um, Rob guessed Polygon VR. Interesting. So company. Um, so I thought company B, company A would have been Dreamscape Nomadic or the spaces because they had the fewest locations. Company B was probably the void because they'd actually have like a dozen or more locations by now. So they're definitely to the right on the scalability side um, versus some of the one, the other ones in that space. But um, so he said, no, I think we believe that for real, by full bo- f- by virtual or full value, the only other company that does that is Dreamscape. And Dreamscape does by far the best job of it. Um, their technology was built on really super accurate tracking and great inverse kinematics. Like their, their models are fantastic. And you know the fact that you can throw a ball back and forth and it's accurate enough to track, um, those guys are, are doing some amazing stuff. And the music, when your music's done by Hans Zimmer, you have, um, you have a, an unfair advantage. 
Um, and then company C, what do you guys think company C is? So that's the arena one. It's also the biggest dot, and I'm assuming the size of the dot um, has to do with the size of the company or the number of locations. And I'm wondering if, if Siki, you can, oh okay, yeah, cool, thanks for that. So who do you think company C is? Uh, ben suggests zero latency. Um, and I would, uh, yeah, ZL Mark. I think that one for me was 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 pretty clear. I thought it would be on the same polygon. Okay, I see where you're going. <laughs> it's all polygon. Um, and uh, and so I think zero latency is um, is in there. I would say polygon probably sits north on the immersive side versus zero latency. Um, though size of room really makes a difference. But I agree with uh, with what Andre saying is polygon is um, is uh, is amazing. I think I think Andre Dreamscape's model is lots of content. It's the movie theater model, which is kind of how um, if you when you go back and watch the rest of this video and you and you listen to um, to the commentary. You know, there's definitely this belief that it's the movie theater business, and there's lots of content, and you're gonna have to have lots of content. You're gonna go back and 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 you're gonna go back for content refresh. Um, I think that the gaming industry, because it's interactive, you actually have um, you actually have um, more opportunity to drive repeat play, and games are outstripping Hollywood in many ways. And so this kind of merger of games and Hollywood and location base is gonna be really interesting how that plays out. Um, and then um, I thought um, Company E, interesting, which is the arcades, um, you know, very scalable, but very low on the immersive side. Any guests who that might be? I had my... Um, I had my guess, which I'll tell you if nobody wants to play. But mine was um, um, interesting. Hollow Gate. I think um, I think Hollow Gate probably would be the best bet, um, which is you know very scalable but low immersive. I was thinking Sandbox too, but I wasn't not Sandbox. Um, Springboard as a software play, but they're not really Control V could be in there. Um, and um, but I think um, I think life is saying very immer they're very immersive, and I think for what they are, they are very immersive. They've added haptic vests. They've got some haptics in the controller. But I think comparing immersiveness between you know a tethered system and a free roam system um, kind of uh, is kind of um, apples and oranges. So, um, but I love sandbox. <laughs> I love life. I love you, life. I love the the spirited competitiveness that we've got in this industry that isn't negative and it's not tearing each other down, um, but it really is spirited. And I, and I love that about this business. So, and the last slide, which I'm just gonna blast through really quickly um, is the management deck or the management slide. And, and then maybe we can talk about the team a little bit. Mm -hmm. Cool. cool. So, 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 I so I think within, 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 the, within the context of this investment, I, I so Siki, you, you and I know each other for like 10 years or whatever. And then Steve, and then you and I met through the course of this. And then I, and then met, I met Michael actually, actually post, you know, post, you know, post investment. I think one, I think one, one of the things on this, on this was that I, you know, you know felt like, like and, this is, and this is a little bit like the Asia to US thing as well, um, was that number one, we wanted to make sure that, you know, if, if there was going to be a team that was going to focus on the U.S. because we thought the U.S. was like a really great market for this and it could work in the U.S., that you'd have to end up with a whole office and people and everything that are based in the U.S., which 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 we've done. And then I think the other part of this I would say is, um, you know, we one of the one of the pieces we were trying to diligence for was how important was IP licensing as part of the team, and that's something that we also felt like A16Z could uniquely help. Because we talk to the media companies all the time, we we talk to a lot of the um, you know IP holders, you know. But that was sort of like the one of the gaps that's felt, you know, like it existed here <coughs> that we should at least try and like neutralize the advantage of you know if we were to invest that we should neutralize the advantage of competitors by having, you know, real discussions with people or hire some folks that made this you know really. Um, uh, that, that 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 would be equivalently kind of insidery uh, relative to, to to the competitors. Sir, like finding that strategic fit's really important, and this is something that you know they're talking about, which is how can we help? What's more than money? Um, if you're you know the, like you know it's fine to bring people in that just have money, but if you can find strategic alignment where the investor can help you fill some gaps. 
um, the value of that deal for the founder goes way up. Um, it also aligns the investors and puts them on the same side of the table with a certain part of the business as the founders. And that's what you want, ideally, to have a life that's worth living when you're building a company with third party money. Um, you absolutely have to, you know, you have to have alignment all up and down the company. And that goes from the investors to the board, to the management team, to the employees, to the to the, your customers even, right? Is get everybody aligned and the business really hums. And so I just wanna call that out is try to find that when you're talking to investors. And, and if you don't have that and you're in the beautiful position of comparing investments and maybe you've got two or three options um, and you can't combine them to a way that's beneficial, you know, really lean towards the strategic investor because it's gonna make your life a lot easier. So, exactly. and then, and I think beyond that, you know, I mean, you know, I think like, I think the, the technology, the gaming piece, that all kind of made sense. I think the, um, you know, I think the other, the other piece of it, again, I, th I thought that actually the Postmates experience was extremely relevant and important, was just more that like, oh man, this is going to be like a retail, you know, large retail like chain that is going to need to employ one day, many, many, many thousands of people on the ground. And it was going to be extremely operationally complex, and so I think the other thing that was missing, which which we've I know we've now felt, is sort of somebody who's going to handle um, all the complexity of of retail expansion, you know, um, buying new leases, getting into new leases, construction, like get, do the whole kind of workflow around around that as as the company began to scale. That um, don't be afraid of acknowledging. In fact, you need to acknowledge the holes in your management team when you're pitching. And so, yes, put your strengths forward, but be uh, be okay talking about. Be prepared to talking about what you're missing. You're raising money. Part of the use of proceeds is going to be building your team. Um, and if you don't have the level of self awareness to understand where your holes are and your gaps are in your team, the investor that could be a red flag. That can kill a deal. Um, and it's so important to have. Um, have a team. And in the retail space, you know, one of the things, you know, Jan from Pixelli, I know you're on here um, in Finland, you know, one of the things I was really impressed with them, and they had three locations were expanded to their fourth. Part of their team was somebody who had deep retail experience in negotiating leases. And part of the reason they were profitable was because they negotiated amazing leases with real estate companies to get the economics right. Because when you don't have a cost of goods sold, right, you're selling time, your primary costs are going to be labor and rent and market. And so if you can nail and, and sometimes marketing and rent can be tied together, if you can get a great high traffic location with lots of visibility and in a rent favorable place, you know, you can you can actually set yourself up for success. And and Jan's just saying here, he's saying the first rent, they were talking about eighteen thousand dollars and they got it down to six thousand dollars. And that's by having somebody who understands the market, who can talk the language of the real estate in, uh, investor or the real estate, the landlord. Um, you know, I think that that's like, and have a, and have, and don't be married to one location, play, play that game light. If you're in the retail business and you're looking for locations, play light, take your time, find the best location. Cause once you sign that lease, you are stuck with it, right? It's like getting married, right? Like take your time. Um, don't rush in, don't go to Vegas after the first, don't, don't, don't do the Vegas wedding after the first night. Right. Take your time. Look around. Understand the market. Um, so Sandra's asking a question. You don't need. To, um, actually, what was it? Uh, Sandra's asking, Bob, what's your opinion on having AAA IP high quality content versus non branded content multi games option? Look, I was one of the first people in the industry to do IP based attractions in the amusement industry before, you know, theme parks were building themed roller coasters. I licensed Stargate from the Studio Canal Plus. And I built Stargate laser tag in the mid nineties. Right. And so like, I'm a huge believer of using IP to set context, to differentiate your product. And when I say set context, what I mean is give the person that's playing an idea of why are they there to, to increase that fantasy level and to help blur the line between fantasy and reality, which is what immersive entertainment is all about. And so I'm a big believer of that to do that and to differentiate yourself from the competition. Um, is it necessary today in VR? Absolutely not. Like VR has high curiosity level, high satisfaction level. Um, you've seen the, the reviews. They're the number one thing to do in TripAdvisor in Hong Kong. Do you know how much shit there is to do in Hong Kong? Um, and there's no IP there. So I think it's overvalued with all apologies to um, to my friends at, at Sony and Universal and Paramount that are doing you know IP deals. I think it's going to become important. 
Um, and I think that in some cases it can be leveraged to your advantage, but don't kill your economics. Like the, the, the single unit economics of this business are still questionable in my mind in a lot of cases. And so you lever a whole bunch of cost on top of it with IP right now, and you can blow your economics and kill your expansion plan. So I think it's going to get more important, more important over time as competition sets in. Um, and as narrative becomes a bigger part of the story and storytelling gets woven in. And if this is going to replace or be the next movie theater business where people go and experience longer form VR content that's social and immersive and story driven, then I do think that um, that IP is important. And then AAA is just like, how do you rank AAA? My comment originally was, was compared to what? Compared to console games? Um, and then what's your contrast frame? Is it the total immersive experience? Or is it the quality of the visuals and the story and the epicness of the grand scale of the environments? Um, I think you could, I think you can argue that all day long. And again, if you were pitching this, what's your contrast frame? What are your axes on your comparison model that's going to position you as, as strongest in the marketplace? And that's whether you are doing this internally to get your positioning right for your marketing message on your website and your email campaign if you're an arcade or for your pitch deck if you're building a solution you're selling to investors. I think that those are all individual um, things that you have to consider. So, um, and the last thing on the management slide, by the way, is, um, is, is it, it, it's important, it's usually last, um, and, and, um, and, it's, and it's about building credibility, right? And so, um, make sure that you put the team in there. There's this adage that people, investors, especially in the Valley, invest in teams. And so really think about how you're positioning that. How do you need to round out your team? Maybe if you don't have a lot of money, maybe with advisors, um, maybe with a board, um, you know, maybe with consultants, whatever. But make sure that you're rounding out your team to where it presents really well because investors oftentimes – like if your team isn't strong, no matter how good the opportunity is, they're not going to invest. And in a complex market, and VR is the most complex market that I'm aware of right now, and I've made my living in complex markets for 30 years, um, team is everything because it's going to get hard and there's going to be a grind and you're going to have challenges. And especially in, in Sandbox's business where you're talking about the combination of retail and content and technology um, like, fuck, there's so much there that can, that can and will go wrong. And so you gotta have a strong team that's going to get through it. And so, um, anyway, that's kind of, um, I think that's kind of my, my take on this. I could literally probably do a webinar on each slide, but I won't bore you to that level. Um, I do want to say, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and post them now and we'll spend a couple of minutes taking questions from the audience. Um, and I really want to I want to thank Siki for uh, taking time out of what I imagine is his very busy schedule, if nothing else, just reading emails from people trying to tap into his bank account um, um, to, you know, to join the, the group and to and to share so generously with um, the audience here. And one of the things I'd like to do is um, ask you guys when I post this and send it out to you to share it. I really think that this is information that deserves to be. Um, that um, that deserves to be out in the wild. I think a lot of people can learn from this. And I love seeing entrepreneurs, um, I love seeing entrepreneurs make money, by the way. And I, when I read that announcement, I know there was a lot of jealousy in the audience. When I saw that announcement, I was like, fuck yeah! Um, not only for what it meant for the industry, but for what it meant for the founders of Sandbox. I love when people make money. Um, there's enough money out there for all of us. We all can get rich living our dreams. Um, and that's part of what drives me in this business is to help people figure out how to make money in this space because the space is amazing. Um, and I'm passionate about not the technology, I'm passionate about the people that are in it. And so I really, really, um, I would love for you guys to share this one in a big way if you're willing to, um, to get it out there. And so um, Andre is asking the cinema kind of beaten by Netflix. What about Oculus Quest and the next generation of VR HMD building LBD? Look, I got this question. If I had a dollar in my bank account right now for every time I got that question launching Laser Storm, um, I'd probably be sitting on a beach somewhere um, instead of freezing my ass off in Melbourne. And so um, I think that LBE is always going to be different. And I think if you're building, and I've been very clear about this, if you're running traditional arcades, VR arcades, traditional, whatever that means, um, where you're taking consumer technology, applying it to out of home, you are 
at an existential risk if the home market takes off. And if Quest is super successful, um, which I don't know that it will be, not certainly in console number scale, but if it is, then you're going to have to think about how do you really differentiate your business. And I think for things like Sandbox or things like um, Zero Latency or Dreamscape Nomadic, these high, in, high intensity peak experiences, you know, Randy White talks about that. It's got to be a peak experience um, or he calls it um, a high fidelity experience. And so if you're an LBE, you need to be building high fidelity experiences, whatever that means. It can mean a different thing. I don't think putting people in a 10 by 10 box um, and putting on a headset is going to remain a high fidelity experience for long. And so you're going to have to ramp that up. And that's how you survive. Um, I think um, Jan is asking, ask from your, uh, from uh, after testing Richie's Plank experience, for an example. So yeah, one of the things I'm curious, Jan, and have you rolled that out yet? Or are you still looking at doing it? So, you know, I've been promoting the opportunity as ways to do this on a small scale for arcades is to create, take a Richie's Plank, build, put the plank on the floor, get a mixed cast system. So you do mixed reality and make that a bit of a centerpiece onboarding into your arcade. And so charge 10 bucks for it. It's an easy way for people to try it out. It's really social, um, allows people to share online and, um, and creates kind of like this spectation experience. And everybody's afraid of heights, right? That, or there's enough people afraid of heights where that's always gonna create an amazing um, experience. So I think LBVR is safe, um, but I do believe that, um, I do believe that, um, that you have to differentiate from the home and you have to anticipate where the home is going. And yes, 5G streaming to headsets is gonna be a game changer, but we're three to five years away from that. So let's not get too caught up on that yet. Um, anyway, I'm gonna go because I think I have a coaching call that I've now blown off and hopefully you guys are watching um, and I just remembered and I will, um, I will see you next week. Steve Grubbs from Victory VR and Paradigm Esports is gonna be our guest. Um, Steve is one of my favorite people, entrepreneurs in this space. He is, um, he's doing amazing stuff. He's run a, in Davenport, Iowa, he's run a, a increasingly successful esports lounge for better, or that's my term, not his. He's also running a VR arcade and he's building educational VR content. Um, he has a frog dissection app that won an award at Oculus Connect recently. And so really interesting guy with amazing insights on esports. You should be following him on LinkedIn as well. Um, and I will make sure in the replay notes on YouTube and when I send out the replay email, I'll make sure that you guys have the link to the A16Z pitch room. Um, you can just Google um, A16Z sandbox and both, um, both uh, uh, videos will show up. And I highly recommend watching them both. They're insightful, they're entertaining. Um, and I wanna thank you guys all for joining. Share it online on YouTube, share it on social media. We'll be breaking this down into clips and getting it out. Thanks for sticking with me so long and um, I loved doing this. So hopefully you got something out of it. Siki, again, thank you so much for joining. That was unbelievably generous of you. Um, and I know you guys are busy, busy and I look forward to catching up and, um, and chatting in person sometime. So have a great weekend guys and we will see you next week.